All right, brother, what's going on? I um I almost called Sean because he was on the podcast last week. I almost called him Kit. Did you listen to the podcast? Yeah, I did. I was like, hey, <laughs> Kit. Like, wait, not Kip. You're Sean. Gotcha. <laughs> All right. So now I'm I'm back and I'm and not he as took it as, as a compliment, I was last week. I'm sure. Yeah, that was did. a compliment for Sean. He's like, oh, I'm I mean, moving he up went in life. from like here to here <laughs> within a liter within literally two seconds. So of course he did. Oh, man. You have a good weekend. Yeah. Uh yeah, it was pretty good. I got a lot of stuff done around the house. I was supposed to be heading to Austin today. I'm not doing that. Long story. So we won't worry about it. <laughs> um, and then I, yesterday I was actually going to pull the canoe down because I put it up for the winter and event season, all this kind of, and uh, I, this is what I say. The reality yeah. is like, I just put it up because I didn't want to sand anymore. So I was going to get it down <laughs> yesterday. I'm like, all right, I'm going to sand it. We're going to sand out that hole, get that done. And then it started raining. I'm like, gosh, like talk about the resistance. <laughs> if you guys haven't read the war of art by Steven Pressfield, read that. I have so much resistance kip in my life right now between me wanting to pull the canoe down yesterday. And then it's like, no, we're going to rain. It's like, it hasn't rained for like a month and you got to rain that day. Uh, yeah. Or I was very frustrated last night. Cause I was talking to my wife about a potential surgery that I may have coming up. And I'm like, you know, resistance. I was yeah, so to wanting to I train. Was, I was so disciplined. I was so committed. I was training no less than four days per week for weeks, like yeah. probably, probably ye uh, years. <laughs> and then this happens and I'm like, are you serious? Mm. You know, and it's like other interpersonal communication stuff. I don't need to get into that. I was like, you know, it's like, we're doing so well. We're on top of the world. And then all of a sudden it's like this stuff happens and that comes up and you have an injury or you do something stupid or it rains. And it's like, gosh, yeah. dang, man, I don't mean to shit on anybody's parade today at all. But like, if you're dealing with bullshit right now, and I know a lot of you are, it just sucks. What, what else can I say? It yeah. just sucks. And so pivot, adjust, um, using his opportunity to get better, try to make amends, apologize or whatever, where you need to. And then just, just chalk it up to a learning experience and then just get like, get better because of it. Don't just dwell in your own misery. How was your yeah. weekend Kip on that note? Yeah, it was what, you know, before <laughs> I say that though, like I, I, I totally agree, man. Like I, I literally that the week that my, my dad started going downhill it, it, and it was kind of like he went really downhill bad. And then the next week is, is kind of when he came home hospice and then passed away that weekend. And literally since then, on almost probably 30 days past his death, maybe, maybe even until now, you know, I've, I've been kind of walking around. And I was telling my wife, I'm like, I feel like I'm imploding my life, you know, <laughs> like I was really happy and grateful for things. And I felt like I had like good momentum and stuff. And then I don't know if that just put me in an emotional state that I just got overly sensitive. And then everything is like, not good enough, right? Or it's not the way I want it, or it's not meeting expectations. And you know what I mean? And I'm like, I don't know, like, I, I really felt like at one point, I'm like, I might just be a walking time bomb. <laughs> and I'm just looking for opportunity to destroy shit in my life. <laughs> and it's really weird. So, um, I get and, it, man. but like, to your point, right. It's like, okay, well, you know what opportunity to grow, right. Let's evaluate where's this coming from. And you know what I mean? And look, and look for opportunity to, I don't know, look into it and, and grow from it. So. Isn't it interesting. You said a walking time bomb when I, when you said that, I was like, yeah, we self-sabotage. Yeah. Right. We have one external thing happen. That's unfortunate. Sure. Yep. And, and I'm not trying to Dis dismiss or downplay your father's death or, you know, my father died yeah. three years ago. And, and I, I hate to say it was unfortunate. It's worse than that. It's, it's yeah. way worse than that, but, but kind of unrelated to these things that I'm, that I'm sabotaging though. Exactly. <laughs> you don't have to compound yeah. it because this thing happened and yet yeah. we do it, you know, it's like, ah, yeah. my dad died. And so I'm going to start, you know, being a, complete a-hole to my wife wait yeah. what like what does yeah. that have to do with the way you treat your wife or you know i'm dealing with this little little injury i'm dealing with and so 
you know, I'm going to, I'm going to blow up order of man because I'm pissed. Wait, what? What yeah. are you talking about? Like, what does that have to do with anything yeah. order of man related? And yet we do it because you said it. I'm going to play the yeah. victim, throw a little pity party. You know, maybe I'll get some attention. I remember I got in a fight. This is a funny story. I got in a fight when I was, I think I was in seventh or eighth grade. And the kid gave me a black eye and a bloody nose. Like he beat, he beat me up pretty good. Yeah. And so I had a black eye. Actually, no, I'm sorry. I didn't even have a black eye. I had a broken blood vessel in my eye. It wasn't even oh. black. It was just, I broke a blood yeah. vessel and I got a bloody nose. Like it's a little fight, you know, no big deal. Yeah. And I remember I went to school. This was probably on like a Friday or Saturday. Me and this kid got in a fight over. It was legitimately, it was over a Playboy magazine. <laughs> it was his and you stole it or what? <laughs> I can't exactly remember. I just remember naked women and a black eye. That's really like yeah. all I remember because yeah. <laughs> it was in eighth grade or seventh grade. I think it was. I think we had found one and somebody, I can't even remember. Somebody had like tore it up and like threw it over all over the park. And then somebody's mom found it and then knew it was us, uh, like the, the group of boys that ran together. Yeah. And, uh, and then somebody ratted so-and-so out that it was there. Like what, a, like who knows? I don't even, yeah, yeah. and so we got in this little fight, right? And I get to school, that was a Saturday or Friday. And I get to school on Monday and I had this broken blood vessel, bro. I got like hugs and like all the girls were paying attention to me. And I'm like, I want to like deliberately punch myself in the eye yeah. next time and, and like get some loving from these ladies. You're like, I don't need a playboy. I need a black eye is all exactly. I Exactly. That's all I need. <laughs> and then I look at it, what, 30 years later. That's what we do. We still do that. Yeah. Right. Like we're like, oh, my life's hard and all these things happen to me and people hate me and people are out to get me and I have a black eye. And so like maybe if on social media, I show you my black eye, you'll give me some attention. And so we laugh at that story about when I was, you know, 12, 13 years old about getting a black eye and all the cute girls at school give me a hug because they saw how, you know, hurt I was. <laughs> And I'm like, we haven't grown out of it. Totally. Like we're still playing the victim. We're still using that victim card in order to get what it is we want, whether it's the raise or the attention or the woman or the accolades or whatever. And it's kind of pathetic. Yeah. It's it kind is. of pathetic, man. Totally. It Anyways. brings up an interesting point though, is when we talk about momentum, we usually always talk about it from a positive perspective. But there's also, I, I'm assuming, you know, I don't know, this is drawing the idea that there can be negative momentum, mm. you know, and, and I think sometimes expectations don't get met. Things aren't going as we wish they would go and it creates momentum you know? <laughs> and momentum of what else is not going well in my life. And, in, in a, and it creates this, this movement of negativity, maybe you know, and self-sabotage based upon what we're talking about. It's interesting. I never thought of momentum as maybe even being negative. I haven't either. But one thing I got thinking about, as you said, that is obviously you live in Northern Utah. We got the, you know, the Rocky mountains and whatnot. There's no mountains here. People say they're in mountains. They're not mountains, but in hills, Utah, yeah. you have mountains. <laughs> yeah. Hills, ant hills. Uh, and you know what I'm talking about? You'll, you'll be going down, um, that highway. I don't know what it is from salt Lake up to like Heber and park city, that area. Yeah. Is that yeah. The 80, 80, so I 80, yep. 80, and you're coming down the 80 and there's all these turns like twists and turns. And it's all, it's like a down, the whole thing is downhill. Yeah. And, but every once in a while you'll see, you know, runaway truck gravel pits. Yeah. A couple of them down that freeway in that short distance. Yeah. And so it's like, yeah. Like if your brakes are out, you got to hit that gravel pit to slow yourself down. And I, I think that's a good point, you know, Kip, you and I, and I'm obviously we had a personal discussion before this. I'm not going to get into the, the specifics, but you know, there's some, some of that negative momentum based on some assumptions on both of our parts. And it's like, you know what? It's going to hurt. It's going to suck, but let's like, we got to hit the gravel pit. Yeah. Like we got to hit the gravel pit. We got to put the brakes on. We got to run into the if gravel. If we let this keep going. Yeah. It's going to be We're going to wreck. Yeah. Right. So you had to let go of some of your pride. I had to let go of some of my pride. 
And then we have a good conversation for the last 40 minutes before we hit record. And it's like, cool. We hit the gravel pit, a mm. little awkward, a little uncomfortable. Um, yeah. You know, yeah, we had to be vulnerable, which is your favorite word. <laughs> or uh, humble. Humble, <laughs> uh, authentic. And then you're like, okay, you hit the gravel pit. You're like, all right, that wasn't totally comfortable, but like, we're safe. Like all is good. Let's reset, figure That's out what breaks. needs to be figured out and then mm. get back on the path. Yeah. I like it. Um, so I ran Ragnar, the I Zions saw that. trail relay. Yeah, yeah man. You, you, you would love this. So first off, I went with a couple of guys from the IC, uh, a handful of guys were in the IC was part of the team representing. It was awesome. I uh, saw Greg Nielsen out there running his order of man shirt. Awesome. Um, Greg's going to hear this and he's going to maybe laugh, but I almost thought maybe Greg might be dying when I saw him on the trail <laughs> <laughs> and I messaged him. I said, dude, how you doing? He's like, let's just say it was an eventful weekend. So I'm assuming there's more to the story, but you know, his kid, by the way, his kids are killers. I don't know if you know yeah. that I his boys, that. his boys are ki- runners. They are amazing. Oh, okay. So this, like, so there I'm might talking, be some like dads try to level up maybe a little bit harder than he should. <laughs> Greg, I love Greg. I love Greg, but his boys are way better at running than him. Like they're state <laughs> champions. They're track all stars. I don't know it. if you knew that, but they are, no, they are runners. That. Yes. That's funny. Absolutely. Yeah, I saw him on my eight miler and I'm like, and after we passed, I said to Asia, I'm like, we should have asked him if he was okay, if he needed some water or something, because <laughs> I thought he's not, he's not looking very good, you know? So, but, um, but here's the part I wanted to share that was super funny. So we're, we're pulling down camp on Saturday and I have my order of man testosterone shirt on um, my order of man swag, which you guys can get at store.orderofman.com. And he goes, dude, I love that shirt. Do you want to trade shirts? And I'm like, Sure. Let's trade shirts. You know what I mean? <laughs> so we did our, our little exchange shirt thing. And I ended up having some sweaty dudes, uh, CrossFit shirt from San Diego. And now he has the order of man, uh, testosterone <laughs> shirt. So, but it, it was awesome. actually quite funny. Yeah. That is funny. Yeah. yeah the he, testosterone builder isn't one that we even have available anymore because it was hilarious and, but it ran its course. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it was hilarious. Yeah, dude, that, that Ragnar is no joke. So that was my, I think that was my first event when I started to get in shape. That was the first event that I went and did up in Zion and oh, it's different. You, so you've done the trail relay kind of, okay. kind of. So <laughs> the Ragnar, I think that's one of the only ones where they do it. Like it's a, it's a trail instead of just the road. Yeah. You camp and you do loops. Yeah. 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 So I did my, if I remember right, there was like an eight miler and like a five or six miler, if I remember right. Yeah. There's two 4.5s. And that's what it was changed from last year, but two 4.5s and one 7.8. Oh no. So we had like a five ish, an eight ish okay. and a 13 ish. Oof, that's fun. And so I did my, the first thing I did and I don't run, I'm not a runner at all. Yeah. Zero. The first thing I did is the five miler and that was in the afternoon. And I was like, that was cool. Like that was enjoyable. And then I got woken up at 2 AM and I'm like, Hey, (laughs) it's time for your eight miler. And at first I was like, this sucks. But then I was running through the forest and I felt like an Indian, like, cause there was just the stars and, you know, maybe a glow stick here and there. Awesome. It was awesome. And I'm like, okay, well, that was cool. Like an eight miler. I was, it was like 2 AM. I'm like, that was awesome. And then I wake up at like six or seven. Cause that's when my next 13 miler was, and maybe it was 11. I can't remember exactly whatever, but that was when the big one was. And I'm like, Oh, this one's going to suck. And I woke up and my tent is like in my face. Like I'm laying my back and the tents in my face. And I'm like, what is going on? I'm like, push my hand out and I get out of the tent and it had snowed. <laughs> And I get out of the tent and there's this van that's backing up. I'm whoa, 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 whoa. I stop him. My buddy's tent was right there. He almost ran it over. There was that much snow on the ground. Yeah. And we stopped him. He was like a foot or two away from running over my buddy. Yeah. Cause his tent's all flattened out. (laughs) Couldn't even see the tent. (laughs) Yeah. So then I go into the chow hall. Cause there was like this big, like food place. If I remember right. And I'm like, all right, well, I'll get some breakfast. The guy that's running before me is probably going to finish up in the next, you know, 20 or 30 minutes. I'll just grab a quick bite and then I'll go run. 
and I'm dreading it because it's a long race, the long portion of the race. And I get my food and they come in and they're like, hey, the race has been canceled. No way. Because, because the so guys bad. that were on the trail were literally up to their shins and knees in just water and mud and cold. And so they canceled the race and they still gave us our things. And I'm like, well, like we didn't finish, you know, technically. And they're like, ah, but you were here. I'm like, okay. So I got a participation trophy from the Ragnar. Yeah. So I'm like, I don't even think I, I don't have it displayed because I didn't finish it. It's like a participation trophy. But yeah, yeah. I got two thirds of the way through a Ragnar race one time. <laughs> I've heard about that story of it snowing up there before. Yeah. Like someone crazy. told me about it. Yeah. It was crazy. Yeah. Yeah. It's fun. It's I was times. grateful that I got out of the 13 miler. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> yeah. My first run with, so we had two teams. And so we could run with our spouses was oh, kind of the cool. idea. Yeah, that's fun. And um, so my time was really bad because, you know, I had to run with Asia. my wife. But Right, of course. Yeah. But um, well, hopefully she doesn't what I was going to say. Oh, hold on. Dude, so Let I, me timestamp this so I can yeah, say yeah. this to <laughs> So I um, totally, um, maybe, I, maybe I shouldn't share this on the podcast. So had a burrito the night before, totally wrecked me. And I was like, <laughs> Don't eat I was up all night long, shitting all night long. So I got <laughs> zero sleep, woke up in the morning. I'm like, babe, this may go south, you know? So I'm like, bring some wet wipes. Cause I might just be taking the dump in the middle of this run. You gotta I do what you no gotta do. Man. How this is going to work out. Luckily it didn't happen, but I'm like, oh man, I just feel like crap. But by the third I've... round, I was like, woo. I'm renewed. Feeling good. I all, yeah, I'm young again. Yeah, it was great. But that first one was brutal. I thought I was going to die. I've li I've had friends that have literally shit themselves on marathons. They're like, I'm not yeah. stopping. And because they just they're poo. They're racing. Right. Yeah. But they just shit. Yeah. I'm like, no, there's no, there's no, <laughs> I can't. I mean, maybe there is. Apparently there is. But I can't think of a race that I care so much, but again, I'm not ever going to be in the contention in a running race like ever. Yeah. So I can stop at the port of John and do my business and get back on without well, worrying think about of it losing this way. anything. So, so some of these people, so they're not, maybe some of these people are not winning to, or not running to win. They're trying to qualify. But they're running for a time to qualify. Yep. And so if you've done a couple of marathons and you didn't hit the qualifying time to go to Boston and because now you're, you're doing- <laughs> exactly. And now you're doing good. And if you potentially stop, you're not going to qualify to go to Boston. I don't know. I think I would piss myself. I think I, I would. Yeah. I could go to Boston. I, it's crazy. And I'd not say, run, but I could actually go to Boston <laughs> and not have to run. They have, they have an airport in Boston. Yeah. Uh, you could just fly into and just like, enjoy Boston. Pay for it. Yeah. <laughs> you don't have to run. You can enjoy yourself. You can eat you know, oysters and look at, you know, American history and you don't even have to run a marathon. And the other cool thing is you could do it when the marathon's not happening and you don't have to deal with traffic and people. <laughs> it's awesome. You should guys yeah. should try it. It's actually quite amazing. Yeah. That's it's amazing. <laughs> All right. Questions. Let's do it. Uh, yeah. We got to do. All right. We're uh, filling these questions from the IEC uh, to learn more about the iron council orderman.com slash iron council. Um, it's not open currently, but, uh, sign up for newsletters and whatnot. Stay connected for when 30 days that back up about 30 days, a little less than. Okay. Josh Langdon for both of you. What were your, uh, what are your two or three takeaways from the man and cage debate? And he's probably asking Sean this, but luckily I was there as well. So I can share my opinion, but so takeaways from yeah. man and caged. I mean, for me, I, I got to be involved in, in the planning, in the structure and the organization of it. And so for me, I, I wasn't just a regular attendee. I was able to be there and be involved in the, all the behind the scenes, which I'd never done before. So that was really cool. And I'll just tell you, my biggest takeaway is just be around the right people, mm. add value to people's lives, enhance people's lives, try to serve other people. And then you get a seat at their table. And yeah. that's really cool. Um, and I will say, and I'm not, I'm going to say this tactfully is that that's, that's my table. Yeah. Like it isn't anybody else's table. I'm the one that invited all those people. I'm the one that, 
uh, with help again, I'm not trying to be arrogant, but like, but you're the, I had to create that that table. Yeah. Right. I'm like, Hey, I want you at the table. Kip. I want you at the table. John Pedros, Tanner, Jack, Matt, Steven Mansfield. Those are all my connections. I'm like, well, I want you guys at this table. So I got to hand pick who I wanted to take at the table. And that was cool. Yeah, like that was really cool. Sometimes we're like searching around for everybody else's table and how do we get involved in other people's stuff? Mm-hmm. And that's good. You should, you should add value to those people's lives. I think there's another question about adding value here in a minute. Um, but like create your own table. That was my biggest takeaway is like, mm. be worthy of creating your own table that other people want to be part of. I like it. Um, I'm assuming guys can still stand up, sign up to watch the recorded stream. Do you, you know can. the details yeah. of that? Okay. Yeah. If you just go to manuncage.com, I think it still says virtual conference, but if you just sign up, you're going to get access to all the recordings. Yeah. So, um, so what I'm about to say, I, I didn't want to say this if guys weren't had that option. Um, man, I, it's funny. I would have assumed coming into the event that I would have resonated with certain speakers more than others and their topic. And Jack Donovan's so interesting was so cool. You'll and, never hear it anywhere else. Yeah. And was so spot on. I, I thought, you know what? That's a really, like, it's an angle around masculinity that I never heard anyone kind of talk about to be frank. And it was, it was awesome. Like I mm. really, really resonated with Jack's um, presentation. Um, and, and that was, and, and kind of the takeaway. And I've had this mentality a little bit of it's funny society makes constructs right and distinctions or whatever and i think some of those distinctions we fall into and 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 i don't know why i shouldn't even be careful or act like i'm trying to be careful with what i'm saying but we do this shit already so i'm just gonna go with it so if a guy is overly feminine and shows up slightly feminine, maybe the way he speaks or the way he dresses or whatever, what does society do? Oh, he must be gay. Like Mm. almost instantly versus like, well, maybe he's not gay. Actually, maybe he's just a little bit more feminine. And, And I wonder how many times someone might be a little bit more feminine or someone or a female might be a little bit more masculine. And then they start assuming that they're gay. They start assuming these things because everyone's kind of pigeonholed them into this bucket versus like, Oh no, you're just, you know, you like these things. Right. Mm -hmm. Or you're just maybe a little bit more of a feminine guy. And maybe you might be more attracted to a more masculine woman or, or whatever. And, and I've always had that kind of thought is like, I wonder how often we, we pigeonhole ourselves or put ourselves into buckets based upon how society interacts with us. And it was really interesting because it's kind of aligned a little bit with Jack Donovan's, you know, talk around how masculine men have kind of removed themselves out of the arts because the arts have been kind of coined as more feminine. feminized. Sure. Yeah. And because they've been more feminized, it's like, and I used to think that all the time. I'm like, why can't there be a masculine ballet dancer? Like, why does he have to start talking different. Why does he have to now be more feminine? Why? Right. Or, or why, why do gay people talk like that? Totally. Or why does a skateboarder kid have to dress like a skateboarder? Why can't he love skateboarding and be a preppy and dress different, but just love something. And it's very interesting how we latch our identities onto whether it's the music we listen to, or if I'm part of a band or I'm a jujitsu player or whatever. And all of a sudden now I start dressing different. I talk different and all these things. Why? Because some social grouping collective said that you need to dress a certain way. If you listen to this kind of music, or you have to act a certain way, if you are more feminine or masculine, but I actually don't think it's that. I mean, I I do agree that it's a silly, I don't think that we feel like, Oh, why do I have to start dressing that way? I think that as for example, jujitsu or, or anything. It doesn't matter. Like ballet, jiu-jitsu is probably jiu-jitsu a bad arts. example, actually, because most guys, you, they don't, there's not a, I don't know. Go ahead. No, I think there's a culture of jujitsu. I know, but I don't think a bunch of guys change the way they dress and handle themselves to fit the culture oh, I think of jujitsu. Oh, you think 100%. so? 100%. Oh, yeah, 
Okay. Yeah. A hundred percent. So I was talking with Pete, he's been in jujitsu a long time. He's like, I can, I can just look at somebody and tell by the way they carry themselves and walk, whether or not they do jujitsu. Mm. Mm. And I, I, do and I believe, believe that's that. true. Yeah. I do believe that. Yeah. But I think people, and, and the more immersed you get into a thing, whether it's jujitsu or ballet or singing or podcasting or whatever, the more immersed you get into it, the more you start to look like the architect, art, archetypical fill in the blank. Yeah. And I don't think it's this like weird, trivial bullshit either. I actually think it's hard, hardwired into us to be part of the tribe. Like, mm. like take, take, um, you know, but who, the, the Patriots, who identified the tribe, like the tribe that seemed, is that the tribe, the just tribe over time. Yeah. I mean, yeah, there was always the, the person who started it. Right. Yeah. Like there's always one and then there's two, but the tribe. Like, so I went to Mexico well, you were down there. Uh, yeah. December of last year and Jordan Stanley, good friend of ours, big advocate for what we're doing, met me down there. And, and it was funny. Like we looked at each other, we were in the exact same thing. Like he had some <laughs> either, either jeans on or some khaki, you know, pants and a black order of man shirt and a camo order of man hat or a green order of man hat and a beard. Yeah. That's an order of man guy. Yeah. Or the, or the picture we took, every guy had a beard, but one, you know, cause exactly. I think we got tons of comments like, Oh, Right. Someone didn't Do you have, know. To have a beard to do, do this? Yeah. Yeah. But like, I don't think it's trivial. I actually think it's, I think it's actually an integral part to being part of society. That's one of the things that I see wrong with America is that I love that we're so diverse and we have this like melting pot of all these different people, but at the same time, nobody's required to assimilate into a culture. There is no American culture. Hmm. There used to be. But it isn't yeah. anymore because we've brought in everybody and everybody has their own culture. And then what do they do? They isolate themselves. So you have pockets of different cultures and different countries around. And you'll be like, yeah, New York, that's a big population of Jewish people. It's like, well, why New York? Why couldn't it be, you know, rural Maine? Like, why isn't it? Well, it's because yeah. we're trying to survive. And yes, the threat of us the threat of us having to face some sort of violent encounter or potentially uh, meet our, our demise prematurely is, is definitely declined over the past hundred to 500,000 years. There's still that thing built into us. Like, no, I want to be part of the jujitsu club because what it signifies to me and other people is that I'm strong. I'm healthy. I'm capable. I care about defending myself or somebody who's, um, yeah, Tanner's a great example. Tanner's not gay, but like a lot of people, he dresses really well. So a lot of people might say, oh, that guy's gay. Yeah. Or alternatively, he cares about his appearance. He understands the importance of it. He likes the way that he looks. He, that aesthetic is important to him. It makes him feel good. And yet we put ourselves into these tribes because there's a benefit to us. Yeah. Right. There's a benefit to us for doing it. I, I think about it on a surface level of, of sports. If you take the Patriots, like there's no, there's no guessing as to why somebody would put a, 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 a Patriots uniform on like that does not play for the Patriots. Like they have a, this incredible dynasty of, of winning, but why in the world would anybody put a Browns uniform on? Yeah. Other because than there's to be something in it. Tribe. Yeah. Right. And there's something in it for them. We're the underdog. Like yeah. we're tough and no, and the fact that nobody, we're the rebels, nobody likes us. And yet we still believe in the truck. Like there's value in that. Yeah. And it isn't, to me, it isn't surface level. It's, it's yeah. deep. It's really deep. Um, mm. And, and it's kind of frustrating because we do isolate ourselves. I wish sometimes even as American culture, we would, we call ourselves the melting pot, but really what we're not, it's like, it's like oil and water. You know, you pour, pour oil and water into a big pot or cauldron, they separate, like they don't, they don't mix. And so you might call it a melting pot. But to me, when I hear melting pot, I'm like, oh, melting, like we take all of these different cultures and we combine them into one, but that's not actually what's happening. What we start to see pockets of diversity, but diversity to me means you take your ideas. I take my ideas and we're, we melt, we merge, but that isn't what's happening. This is a whole lot of isolation and it's tribal and it's ancestral and it's a survival technique. And it's something that we'll just never grow out of. Yeah. I, I think what I'm getting out of this is just intentionality of 
do you want to be part of that tribe or what that tribe's made up of? You know, cause I use the analogy of like, well, I like this music or I want to be a skateboarder, but now I have to start, you know, maybe ask yourself like, oh, you know, I want to skateboard, but do I want to be part of that tribe, right? Does that tribe represent what's best for me? Is it going to benefit me overall? Or can I just participate in that sport and not necessarily, you know what I mean? Tie my identity to that grouping, right? And you should be able to do that with things yeah. that don't matter, like skateboarding. Like yeah. it really doesn't. Now, when we're talking about moral issues and you have the left versus the right, I think that's become more of a moral discussion and I'm not in, interested in tying myself to an immorality. Skateboarding yeah. is not immoral. Yeah. You know, I, I, I actually with the, so I was big into CrossFit years ago, probably like three, three to six years ago. That was like my gap where I was big into CrossFit and they would have these things at CrossFit and they'd have tournaments. And I never got into CrossFit culture because I'm like, I'm not, I don't care about the culture. I care about yeah. health. I care yeah. about taking care of myself. And so I'd never got into the culture of CrossFit, although I was big into CrossFit at the time. Yeah. Interesting. All right. Jerry McNilly. Kip, hold on. Hold on one yes, second. Yeah. I can hear, I can hear Brecken. I got to go shut him for a minute. I don't know if you can hear it. He's got the, he's playing his electric guitar. So let me just shut him <laughs> down for a second. Hold on. All right. No worries. Sorry about that, man. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> he's upstairs down, him and Eli, so I can hear him when he's rocking out on that electric guitar. <laughs> All right, go ahead. All right, Jerry McNilly, as a single man, what ideas or ways can you fill your time without spending too much money? I often find myself doing all kinds of fun things to keep from sitting in front of the TV and then find myself broke at the end of the week. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, Cause I don't know anything that doesn't cost money. It all costs money. Here's one that doesn't cost. Well, initially it will, but it might actually yield a result is start a business. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, as a single man, if you had time on your hands, I, I'm not, I would never hope that I was single. Cause I hate that world and dating and all that kind of stuff. But yeah. if I was single, you know how much I could ramp up the order of man stuff. Yeah. I Come mean, every, yeah, every married guy would be like, you know how productive I would be? Yeah, <laughs> for sure. So, I mean, one thing you could do is you could just start a business. And yeah, you're, you're going to have to invest in whatever tools are required for the trade. But at the end of the day, that's a business. So that's an investment in yourself. And that's one way to keep yourself occupied, to add value to people's lives, to make yourself better, and to make money while you're doing something that's meaningful and important to you. Whether it's taking pictures or a woodworking uh, or starting a podcast or any number of things, selling art, you could do that and you could find a way to make money doing it. And then you won't have to worry about how much it's costing you. You're actually making money doing the thing you enjoy. Yeah. Like it. All right. Drew Sands. What about uh, you? What are, what, what are there some things that you would say? Like, I, I don't mean, know what I doesn't mean, cost money anymore. What's on my mind, right? I just start, go trail run, run. Yeah. Camp. Yeah. Fitness, camping backpacking but i mean i get that there's some gear element to that but um, i mean there is but not really cheap. yeah like come on you, you've already got some hiking boots you've already got a pair of pants that you could wear you've already got some lightweight stuff 
you, you've probably got a 50 or $60 backpack of some sorts that yeah. you can use. Like, come on. And also, you know, you could borrow stuff. Like if I was not a backpacker, I'd call you up and be like, Hey Kip, I'm going backpacking. Can I borrow one of your, your rucks? And be like, yeah, sure. And I would yeah. just borrow it and it wouldn't be a big deal. Or, or you're like, Hey, I need a tent. It's like, cool. Just borrow somebody's tent. They, yeah. they'll, they'll help you out. No problem. Well, and that's the other side of backpacking. That's super fun is the minimalist side of it. Go make a buddy burner. You know, remember those from yeah, for sure. Boy Scouts with the tuna can, make yep. yourself a buddy burner, do your own bedroll. Man, you don't need money. It's better anyways. <laughs> well, <laughs> here's another thing you could do. Anyway. And I don't know if this is here. Maybe you think it's wrong. Tell me if you think this is wrong. Okay. Okay. So you can organize something and let's say the thing is going to cost. Um, let's say it's going to cost a thousand dollars. Maybe it's like a, a camp and you have to pay a thousand dollar fee or like something, or it's a hunt and the hunt's going to cost, you know, $4,000. And so let's just say, um, let's just say it's a thousand for the sake of math and you can have 10 people involved. And so you're like, okay, well, everybody can pay, you know, a hundred dollars. Tell me if this, you think this is wrong. It's I like, well, so. I organized it. So everybody else is going to pay $110. And then they pay my, like, I don't pay a thing, but they pay 110 and that covers my entrance fee to it. As long as you're communicating it. Okay. That's fair. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. I think as long as you're like, Hey, and just so you know, you know what I mean? Since I'm organizing and putting this together, you know, I'm not, I'm not paying the full amount. Right. Yeah. I don't okay. Think so yeah, I think, I, I think that's a good distinction is, and I, I've, I haven't done that. Like I got a hunt that's coming up in Hawaii. I told you about, and yeah. we each pay a fee. And I could probably like say, Hey, it's this much instead of this much. And I don't think anybody would balk at that. I pay my own fee because I just think, I don't know. I, I'm just kind of brainstorming a little bit. Would it be wrong to not pay my own fee and have you guys cover my fee? It's, it's just like a philosophical question to consider. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Hmm. All right. Drew, Drew Sands. What are a few ways you've been able to add value to other professionals that have allowed you to open up access to their network? Ways well, they've, you've been they've, able to add value. Yeah, they've allowed they've me done to it because I have added value, yeah. right? And so the real thing is not how can you add value, but the real question is what do they need right now? Hmm. And are you aware of it? Yeah, because if you're like, how can I add value? You might just be beating your head against the wall because- you don't, you, don't you don't know what they need. I don't know. Yeah. You know, I, I have no idea. So a great example of this would be Josh Smith. We just did a podcast with Josh Smith. He's the co-founder of uh, Montana knife company and Josh Smith knives. And I went up there and I spent, uh, I think I was up there for, I was up there for four days. It should have been three, but I got my flights canceled. Uh, and I spent time with him and his wife. He had me stay at their house. He took, you know, two days out of his work schedule to help me build a knife. In fact, I'll show it to you guys. Cool. Um, you know, why, why would he do that? <clears throat> like, why would anybody do that? Well, because there's something in it for him. And I don't, I don't take that wrong. This is the night. I don't know if you can see the, yeah. the right angle. It's awesome. This is the knife that I, that I forged there with him. Um, well for him, it's like, he's got Montana knife and he's trying to get this out to the masses. And the people who listen to our podcast are obviously, you know, I think more inclined to buy a knife from a, a, a U.S. made knife from him. So that makes sense. We'll do a podcast together. I'll put it out there on the on the waves and the, and in return, like you have me out and help me fill, forge a knife, and that's good. When I reached out to Jocko initially, it was it was extreme ownership. He wanted to sell that book, so it's like cool. I'll help you sell books. Like figure out what they want and help them get what they want. The, like, don't worry about what you can offer. Don't worry about how to add value. The first question is, what does this person need? They need to sell books. They need to sell knives. They need to sell their course. When I reached out to TJ Dillashaw before he was suspended, I think he's coming back now. Uh, he had, he had just opened up a fitness course called rain. I believe it was R E I G N. Yeah. And I reached out to him on Instagram and I'm like, Hey, I know you've got a fight coming up. Um, but you've also got this program and I think I can help introduce guys to this program. Would you like to do a podcast? He's like, yeah, man. Surprisingly, he messaged me back. He's like, yeah, you know, 
uh, I, I would like to, but um, I'm busy with fight camp. And I'm like, hey, no problem. And he re- he talked to his like producers or somebody. And in the meantime, he messaged me back. He's like, hey, these guys really think I should do it because we'll help with rain. I'm like, right, exactly. Like, I'm going to figure out what you want. Uh, Mike Chandler, another great example, did an interview with him twice now, just a couple of weeks ago before his big fight, which was awesome. I know you like yeah, you, you saw, I didn't, wasn't able to watch it, but I saw, you know, the, the, the aftermath. Oh my gosh. But I also watched that guy fight like train. I was like, yeah, no, I get it. <laughs> like, <laughs> guy. Totally. And I actually got to roll with him around too. And he was just toying with me, which was hilarious. Cause you could yeah. tell. I wasn't going hard because I knew he had a fight and I didn't want to hurt him. Not that I could hurt him. That's not what I'm saying, but yeah. there's always a freak chance that if I do something stupid, like, you know, catch him with an accidental <laughs> knee or something that I could, you know, hurt him. I mean, or even just slightly. I mean, I can't count how many times guys in fight camps were rolling hard and someone catches an elbow or a knee and they get cut. Right. And they can't fight. They can't fight. Yeah. Or they're diminished. There's not enough time. To, to heal that cut and they had to get stitches. I mean, right. It, you know, or you and I can mess last things year, up. You and I were, were doing technique and you were trying something yeah. and I did something cause it didn't feel good. And then I hurt your knee. Yeah. And we weren't even like, active rolling. Yeah. Benign, like just, just yeah. a simple little <laughs> stupid thing, you know? So, yeah. but, uh, but yeah, no, I knew he had a fight coming up. And I know he's obviously somebody who gets the marketing component. He's a fighter for sure, yeah. but he also understands the marketing component of the, the Michael Chandler brand. And so I said, bro, I'm going to help you get more guys that are going to watch your fight. They're going to be in tune with you. that are going to want to buy your things or listen to you in the future or sign up for social media. And so I'm going to fly my ass down there, which isn't cheap. And I'm going to fly another guy down there, my video guy, which isn't cheap. And then we're going to spend, I probably spent an hour and a half total with, with Michael. Yeah, that's it. And I was gone for, you know, that took up a, a minimum of two of my days and I spent an hour and a half with him. Yeah. Because I want him to win because I know what's important to him and I find it. And then I find ways to add value and it's an investment into them. And yeah. I know that I will get what I want from it as well. Ryan, I'm assuming some guys might be mistaken and think that, okay, what I'm hearing Ryan say is I need to ask them, oh, what kind of value can I add? So maybe provide your opinion there. Yeah, don't ever. I mean, asking is not bad, but if you guys reached out to me and you said, hey, Ryan, I heard you on the podcast about adding value and I really like what you're doing. Um, can, Can you tell me how I should add value to your life? Well, actually, you didn't just not add value to my life. You actually took <laughs> value from me because what you're really you're asking me to do. To think, yeah. Right. Or even just respond back to you. Yeah. Like, do you think I have time to be responding back to a hundred or a thousand emails? Nobody has time for that. And so if you're like, Hey, I want to add value to your life. How can I do it? I'm like, okay, well you're out. Cause you just told me to add value to your life when you're trying to cloak it under adding value to mine. Right. Another way to do it. And I thought about this with man uncaged event. Let's say somebody reached out to me. They're like, Hey, Ryan, I'd love to have you on the podcast. And, you know, I can talk with you about whatever. A lot of the times people reach out to the pod for, for me to be on their podcast. And I'm not joking, Kip, this sounds hilarious, but it's true. These guys will literally say, Hey, I'd love to have you on the podcast. Cause it will really help me promote my brand. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. I, I mean, I can appreciate you want to grow your, your brand, but like, do you hear yourself? Yeah. You want me to come on your podcast so you can promote your organization. Awesome. How much, how much are you paying me then? Like what's the, yeah. How's I mean, this, that's how's a this a win-win? Silly. Yeah. That's yeah. a silly, silly thing. Right. And so here's what I would do is if I, let's say, let's take man on cage because we were talking about earlier. If I had, you know, Bedros and, and John Lovell and all these guys speaking. And I was like, man, I'd really like to have Bedros on the podcast. You know, exact, here's exactly what I would do. And I say exactly this is what I did. I'd reach out to Bedros and I'd say, Hey, Bedros, I have a podcast. It's called Order of Man. And I know you have an event in three weeks called Man Uncaged. And, um, I'm come, I paid for a ticket to come to Man Uncaged. And I actually got five of my buddies to buy tickets. And all six of us are coming out there. 
And I thought it would be really cool to have you on the podcast, not only to promote to these six guys, but other guys will be there. And then that way, when us six or seven or eight or 10 of us get there, they'll already have a connection with you. And that way, when you speak, like they'll, they'll see, and they'll have a, a deeper connection with you. Okay. Well, immediately what I did is I'm like, I, I literally had people. So if it's 700 bucks times six people, you know, that's uh, what 40, 4,200, right. I, I just created $4,200 in revenue for you. And all I'm asking in return is for you to spend 40 minutes with me on a podcast. I'm much more likely to land that podcast than the guy who says, Hey, I just really think you could help me blow up my business. I don't care about your business. I care yeah. about mine. Yeah. So, well, and I, and I feel if you really cared, Ryan, like guys would be listening to the podcast. They know, they know what you're up to. They know what upcoming events, they know what kind of industry, what kind of avenues you're working in. And so in most cases, if you don't know how to provide value or you don't have some ideas, it's probably because you're not consuming or consuming their content enough, or you're not aware of them enough as an individual to know how you can serve. Yes. And that's on you. If you yeah. want to connect with somebody, then you invest. Don't ask other people. Don't ask that person to invest. Like, why would I reach out to Bedros and say, Hey, Bedros, I really like what you're doing. How can I help? Yeah. That's not his job. His job's not to find me work. It's your job. So if you yeah. want to add value, you do the research, you put in the legwork and then figure out what it is and then do it. And also I would say this, do it without expectation of anything in return. A lot of that stuff will return, but just do it because you care. Genuine. Yeah. Right. So I had a guy reach out to me. He's, he's an artist and gosh, I feel bad because I'm drawing a blank right now on, I'm going to pull it up because I, I'm, I just can't for whatever reason. Anyways, uh, Sarge died. And I had two, two guys reach out on Instagram. They're like, hey, man, can I do some artwork for you? Hmm. Like, just send me a picture of Sarge. And I send them a picture. And, you know, within a matter of, you know, three or four weeks, they sent something back. And one of them is a very realistic oil painting, probably 12 by 12. And I have it, I have it framed. Uh, and it's in our living room. And the other one's probably... I would say maybe like 15 by eight and it's a, you know, full profile of Sarge and it's a little bit more abstract and I have it hanging in the hallway. Those guys didn't have to do that. That's meaningful yeah. and important to me. And now I look at those guys. I'm like, Oh, cool. And the, and, and one of them, the abstract I've bought two other paintings from him. Like I've literally, I've commissioned him to like, I've paid him. I'm like, Hey, I want you to build. And so I have another one in my living room from the same guy who did Sarge. And he did one of a canoe, me and Breck building a canoe. And it's an abstract painting and it's in the living room. And I paid him to do it because he led with value. And he didn't ever say, Hey, if you need anything else, no, I reached out to him because he cared enough about me to reach out in a moment of pain and say, Hey man, like, I would like to honor that relationship you had with your dog here, like here, nothing, no expectation of anything in return. I liked it. Yeah. I really liked it. I'm like, Hey, by the way, do you do other stuff? Yeah. I want you to commission you to do this. And he did it. And it's beautiful. Yeah. That's great. I have to only do Gosh. one more question, man. I know we're run, we ran out of time really fast. What do you got? Yeah. You asked that You're question. The artist. I, okay. I got you because now I feel bad. I I'm yeah. a total jerk for not, but I was going to ask the question. I was going to message it's you Graham. and say, Hey, maybe make a post later, but yeah, it's Graham. It's uh, yeah, here it is. Graham Robinson dot art. So okay. it's G R A H A M Robinson dot art. And then the other one is Richard. Let me just make sure. Yeah. Richard underscore King underscore Africa. Cool. So there's Richard underscore King underscore Africa. And there's Graham G R A H A M Robinson dot art. Those are the two people who added value to my life when, they didn't need to, and they've never asked for anything in return. Yeah. Okay. Keith Doyle, my kids are very active in sports and combined the games and practices take up six to seven days, um, evenings per week. I often feel guilty missing their events when I go off and do something for myself. For instance, I'm taking a fly fishing class next week and I'm missing a lacrosse game. How do you handle those emotions and still support your kids while still doing the things you enjoy? 
Well, I, I, this is a good question. I think that That's a really you're doing, question. you're actually doing it right. I think you should take care of yourself. And I don't think, I really don't think your kids need you at every game. I yeah. used to think that, but you know what? They're going to have to get used to not everybody acquiescing to their requests, not scheduling their entire lives around the things that are them for important for them. But, you know, of course you want to make it to some of their games as best you can, but to make it to every game, I just kind of feel like is unrealistic and it's just not going to be an accurate representation of life. Yeah. You know, if sometimes it's a trend, like, you would say it's a problem. That's a different thing, yeah. but your kids don't need you at every thing. Like, I got to wonder if you're just teeing them up for failure, trying mm. to make them the center of your universe. <laughs> like you're not, you know, sometimes my kids will come up to me and say, my daughter in particular, she loves to cook. And she's like, dad, would you like this thing? And I'm like, no, thank you. <laughs> and my wife's like, just take it. And I'm like, no, I don't want it. Like, I don't want that cheese ball or like, or dessert cake brownie thing or whatever, because I have my own goals. And so I explained that to my daughter. I'm like, Hey hon, like, I really appreciate you making that. I've got, I'm on a diet right now. And the reason that I'm not eating that is because I'm really trying to be disciplined. Like, I think that's okay. Cause that's real life. You know, my kid, my youngest will come up to me and he's like, dad, here's a Pokemon card. And I'm like, Hey bud, really appreciate the gesture. Not, not anything I can do with a Pokemon card. So why don't you just keep it in your collection? And anytime you're interested, I'll come look at them. I'll do the games. I'll trade with you or whatever, but I don't need your Pokemon card. You hang on to your Pokemon card. My wife's like, Jay, why can't you just can't take the card? I'm like, because <laughs> it's not I, like, I don't want it. I don't need it. It's going to clutter up my life. And he needs to learn, like, not everything's going to revolve around him. Yeah. But like, You're like, deal he's going to, he's going to find it in the recycling trash can later today. Anyway. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so I've never been one to like, bend over backwards for my kids because they offered this thing or whatever, like that's just not real life. So what, so more practically what I would say when I'm talking with my kids is, Hey, bud, I know that I can't remember what sport did he say? Soccer or. Um, he didn't say actually, but like, Oh, okay. missing a lacrosse game. He said lacrosse, he's missing a lacrosse, lacrosse game for a fly fishing. Yeah. I was going to say, if it was soccer, you could miss all the games. It doesn't matter. <laughs> La lacrosse football baseball um here's the uh, the approved uh, yeah yeah track you can miss all of the track and field stuff soccer you can miss all that stuff tennis you can miss that but baseball football wrestling you don't miss wrestling everything else is fine yeah now what, what i would say is hey bud um i know that here's your here's your here's your schedule for the for the year your your games and here's your 12 games or 20 games, however many games you play. And uh, I'm going to be able to make them to 15. But these other five, you've got two games that are three hours away. And this game falls on uh, a time where I'm going to be out of town. And I just want you to let you know ahead of time that I'm going to make it to 15 of your games this year. But the other five, it's not that I don't think you're important. It's not that I don't want you to win or, or be successful, but you got to know that I have other arrangements and other commitments and other things that are important to me. And I just want to let you know ahead of time. So you don't feel like I'm missing it just because I'm flaking out on you. I, I want you to know you're important. That's why I'm going to make 15 games, but the other five, unfortunately I won't be able to make, man, <laughs> dude, you just nipped it in the bud right there. You're done. You, you just set yourself up for success for, and him too. And yeah. then when you get home, you're like, Hey bud, mom sent, there was a game um, last year. My son caught his first touchdown pass. My oldest son, and my wife sent me the video. Um, my, my buddy Brody sent me the video while I was gone. And my son knew I had to be gone. And I got back and I had already seen it. I was already proud. And I said, Hey bud, like I heard you scored a touchdown and mom said, you had the video, show me the video. Let's, let's talk about Watch it. Watch it together. Yeah. And we sat down and we watched it. I'm like, Oh dude, that was awesome. Like, and we went through it and he told me the whole story. And I'm like, in my head, I'm like, yeah, I already know. Like I already know all this stuff but it doesn't matter. Like I'm here to serve him in that moment. So I think if you can plan ahead of time and you can communicate those ex expectations, you can show them why it's important. You can balance that out with being there for 15 games instead of 20. And then when you're gone, you make it important to you. You know, with my son, who's into Pokemon right now, it's like, he'll, he got this like gold pack the other night. It's like this, you know, 40 cards and they're all gold. And I'm like, I don't give a shit about any of this stuff. 
And he's like, dad, look at this Charizard card. Look at this. I'm like, that's awesome. Like, tell me about it. And he's like, it's level 300 and it's, I don't care. I'm like, that's cool. Like, is that good? Is that bad? Like, I have no idea. What, what what do you do with this? Yeah. And so I ask him questions because he's excited about it. And I show him that I don't care about Pokemon, but you know what I do care about? I care about him. Yeah. And so I make that a priority for myself. Got it. All right, sir. You got a jet. Yeah. Yep. All right, guys. Um, Hey, just to close this out, we got the uh, Iron Council opening up in um, mid-June. And if you jump on the website right now, (laughs) you you may or may not jump on the website because we've had some technical issues uh, with orderman.com. So you can try it and see. And if it works, great. And if it doesn't, just wait longer. I don't know what else to tell you. I've been working on it on the back end and we'll get it dialed in. But Kip, appreciate you, brother. Gentlemen, appreciate you guys. We'll be back on Friday. Until then, go out there, take action, and become the man you are meant to be.